What's going on? It's Joey Thurman, and welcome to season three of the Fad or Future podcast. Yeah, I made it three seasons. What's different about this season? Well, yes, I'm still bringing you the world's top experts in fitness, nutrition, mental health, and more, but I'm also talking about my own personal struggles. I get deeper this season because we can all use a little bit of relatability. So I hope you stick with me, you enjoy this season, and thank you for being here. And as always, you get to decide, is it a fad or is it a future? Because after all, we don't want to be fatties, F-A-D-D-Y. Hashtag don't be a fatty. Meditation, sleep, brain detox, brain tap. Today, I have Dr. Patrick Porter on the show, best-selling author, creator of Brain Tap, among so many other things. It's Mental Health Awareness Month, and as many of you know, I struggle with depression myself. We all do. We need to talk about it much more. What can sleep have to do with anxiety, depression, meditation? What are some simple things that you can do right now, even breathing, to relieve some of those stressors in this life? Let's bring down that stress and bring up the positivity. Here's my conversation with Dr. Patrick Porter. What's going on? It's Joey Thurman. Here's another episode of the Fat or Future podcast. And I've got the one and only Dr. Patrick Porter in front of me. Now, if if you want to sleep, quit smoking, be smarter, I don't know, maybe more attractive. Maybe you can do that, for Dr. Porter. I'm not quite sure. But uh, um, you've done it all. You've been in the industry for 30 plus years, best-selling author, all sorts of things, as people heard in your intro. But uh, first of all, thank you for coming on. Well, it's great to be here. So what is it? I mean, you've got so many things that you do and just this amazing biography. What is it specifically? Like if you were going to explain this to my three-year-old child, what is it that you do? Well, we, we, bring, we bring the energy systems back online, really. When you talk about a lot of people are doing this through the biological system, like taking supplements, which we're very big on supplementation, but we have this wonderful ability with our uh, electrical system, like the parasympathetic and sympathetic system. Uh, what I say when I'm simplifying it is we have this thriving brain and we have this um, basically uh, survivor, this thriving brain and the survivor brain. And most people hang out in the survivor brain and it's a it's an energy drain. It's like uh, grounding out a battery. So we wanna liberate the person to have more energy, more really more life in their years instead of more years in their life. You yeah. know, so. Yeah, I mean, that makes a lot of sense. And, and obviously, it's, it's really interesting lately that neuroplasticity and, and brain training, all of these things have become kind of sexy and popular, but you've been doing this your entire life. So what, what has changed from you 30 plus years ago to kind of what you're seeing now and what you're doing? Well, I think the biggest thing is that now we can prove it. Back in the 80s, uh, we, we were more like, uh, we were more cosmic foo-foo, I like to say, because <laughs> People, sure. we couldn't, we would use uh, hand temperature, breath, respiration. We'd use some biofeedback uh, parameters, yeah. but those can always be fudged. There's fudge factor. When you're using things like the Wabi uh, to measure brain waves or the neuro infinity or any other tool, and you actually show somebody, hey, when you're, when this stimulus is, is presented to your body, then the body responds to it in something called entrainment. We, we've always known this, but we didn't, we weren't able to prove it. So now I can go to anywhere. In fact, when I was on the campus of MIT talking to Lou Tai, who did the big research on gamma waves, and I could show her that our little device could get 23% gamma for only, you know, $600 when she bought a, she built a $10 million room to do it. I, <laughs> you know, people are like, wow, you know, they're, they're blown away because it's so simple. But we've been doing it for years and years with the idea of just balancing people's brains and really for myself, because I needed it because I was a hyperactive kid and um, I couldn't I couldn't meditate. I couldn't relax. So, yeah, I mean, so $10 million for $600 sounds like a, a pretty good deal to me. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, there's a saying it says, uh, you know, spirit's simple, but man is complex. You know, you got to put all that. You got to make it really difficult. The <laughs> hardest thing we've had over the years is. There's no way those little things can make your brain do this, but now we can show them. And I mean, we're, we're in so many different neurocenters now. We're in 2,300 clinics now. So we're getting clinical validation every day. And uh, so people are going, wow, did you know it would do this? I don't even know it would do that. I mean, they're coming back to me because, you know, these are people that are pushing the envelope to try to make people well. 
And, you know, so much right now is going into this uh, immunity feature. And, you know, we, we tap in through the psychoimmunology, you know, to get the, get the body up because you got to keep your, you got to keep your energy up. You got to keep positive. You know, we, we live in this negative uh, cycle of news, which is, you know, crushing people's spirit as well as their, their body's functioning. Yeah. So I, I've been trying the brain tap for a, a couple of days now and, and just the, the app and I, I haven't had my um, opportunity to, you know, try the glasses, if you will. Right. Um, but I was telling you beforehand, I've done a lot of different, you know, meditation and visualization, um, um, gratitude, I, all these different things. But the, the first section that I tried was literally just you talking about different things um, in the brain tap and how it works. And, you know, sometimes like I'll start tuning your voice out. And I found myself just kind of dozing off naturally. And I, I don't even know if I made it the full, I think the 16 minutes, I believe was the, the first uh, you know, intro. And then last night I actually did one of the ones that had more music with it, I think was 22 minutes long. And then I I must have like woken up enough to realize to take my headphones out and, and put it back in. So what, it, what is the brain tap specifically doing when, you know, that's happening? Could you explain a little bit about that? Yeah. Well, there's something in science called entrainment and everything in the physical universe is entrained to another. That's why it doesn't fly apart. You know, our, our planet is entrained around our sun as a bigger sphere and our moon is entrained around our earth. Well, we have entrainment principles our brain, if you and I were to take a spaceship and come to Earth, before we got to Earth, we could measure the frequency of the planet. It would go from 0.05 to 100. Hmm. Well, our brain does the same thing. And our brain does it in such a way that if we're around, because we're biologically linked to our environment uh, and our sun, really, the, the light from the sun. So let's say that you and I go down to the ocean and we're sitting talking. Well, without us even knowing it, our body is going to start to match that big body of water. And that big body of water happens to, happens to be resonating at an attuned frequency of 10 hertz. That happens to be alpha. That's why when people go to the ocean, they go, wow, I love the ocean. This is so great. Well, they love the ocean because the brain, in order to have that experience, has to produce acetylcholine. That's what happens when you're in alpha. So you start to feel like you're in love. It's what happens when you are physically in love. So anything you do in that, your brain basically attaches that chemical response to the ocean. Now, if we go to the mountains, we would be at 7.8 hertz frequency, which is happens to be theta. Our body would start to produce GABA. So some people will get tired when they get to the tree line. They go, I, I just can't stay awake because they haven't trained their brain to stay there. But if you were a guru and you wanted to meditate, there's no better place to go than the mountains because you're right there sitting in the middle of a big giant isochronic tone generator. You know, that's basically your body is trying to match. This happens with people too. We all know, you know, you get around people who think like you, that act like you, you know, you're a little more relaxed and free and you're, right. they actually now know that our gut biome actually communicates with one another. So if, if people have like, when the vegan meets the carnivore, you know, that's why they're having the big problems, right? <laughs> so, so we have this, uh, so we're more than just this physical nature. In fact, we're, we're not even but 0. 0.00001% 000 solid and all the rest is information and energy. So when, we're, when we think about what BrainTap does, it's introducing a frequency of not only a frequency like Noje frequencies, uh, Sophigio frequencies, but also different pulse frequencies to get the brain to change because we want to get the brain to, to move out of its fight or flight. Everyone out there I wouldn't say everyone, but 99% of the people, let's say, are in chronic low-level stress. This was before any COVID. You know, this is just running around, people doing it, doing it, doing it all day long. And in order to disengage their nervous system, unfortunately, most people go get a beer or a few beers. Some people say, I just need to have a glass of wine. I go, well, do you stop at one? Oh, well, I opened a bottle. You know, so, you know, you, you have this way of thinking. Right. So, and it's really about disengaging. So, once we disengage the brain, I tell people it's kind of like the old days of computers. If you had a Microsoft computer and something was going wrong, the first thing to do is what? Shut it off, right? You right. reboot it. And that fixes about everything. That's how our sleep cycle works. Mm -hmm. So if we can really get into those deep sleep cycles, that innate intelligence of our body restructures everything, reorganizes, and we wake up in the morning with a superpower. If we don't sleep, it's almost like somebody slipped a little kryptonite in our pocket and we, we can't function during the day. And yeah. 
But what we're doing is we're basically conditioning the brain to move back to its primal positioning because before all this technology, you know, before all the technology that we have on the planet, actually the last hundred years, we used to sleep 12 hours a day. Hmm. You might've had a stressful event four or five times a week. Now with cell phones and uh, 24 hour news cycles and all these things, we're getting bombarded. Now, check this out. Uh, if you have your phone in your bedroom, we've actually done tests where we've, we, can, we can actually record cortical responses in the brain, the deep resources of the brain that you don't even know they're happening. But we know when, before you make a decision, there's an electrical impulse. Well, we put somebody's phone 20 feet away in another room. We put them on uh, the EEG device. We're measuring their brain. Every time they got a text message, they didn't even know they were getting a text message consciously. Their brain was making a response. Really? So so there's was, quantum entanglement. was this the phone going, was there a noise of the phone or a vibration? Yeah, so they couldn't hear it. It was a ding or wow. ping. So we did this because we were, we kept getting this interference when we were trying to do a sleep program. Yeah. And the problem was that people kept having their phones near their bed. And even that's why we recommend like you got to turn it off or put it on airplane mode where you don't get any notifications because our brain, we know, and this has to do with our ears. So when you think of the way we hear things, most people think we hear we have like first attention. That's not really true. We have a filtering system. Our brain takes in 25,000 pieces of information every second. So let's say you and I are having dinner at your favorite restaurant. We're sitting around talking, blah, 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 blah. And all of a sudden you hear somebody a few tables over go, is this a fad? Is it, or is this going to last? You know, and it, 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 then your brain goes, what? Because we, we know what that is. So our reticular activator points that out. Mm -hmm. Other than that, all the rest of the noise in the room is just background, but we're still processing it. That's why some people don't like going to the malls at Christmas, you know, and it's just so crazy yeah. because their body can't process all that information and filter out what they really need to learn. So what, what we've done is we've figured out what causes the brain to be entrained? Our brain loves patterns. So if we can give it the right pattern and change that up, and you're talking about neuroplasticity, mm -hmm. um, maybe we can talk a little bit more about this if you'd like, but we have a, a study that we just did. It was a pilot study that's now going, Seminole College is now helping us put together a hundred people to do this in Florida. The, the pilot study showed a 49% neuroplastic change in women 55, 65 in just six weeks. Now that's unheard of. These were, these were all women that were diagnosed by their doctor as having onset dementia. Mm -hmm. When we sent them back in six weeks, their doctor said, I wish you'd have showed up like this six weeks ago because I wouldn't have done it. We, we had them tested with the Cambridge Science Scoring, which is a, an online quiz you have to take. It tells you if you have dementia or not. Yeah. They all had it before. They didn't have it six weeks later. So we they had, were they were they were just on on the brain tap. Were they were they yes. using the uh, is they glasses? were using the visor too. The, vi yeah, the they visor were using the lights. Okay. Because the, the lights the lights actually uh, for those that don't know what light does, especially the we people go, why do you have lights in the eyes and the ears? Yeah. Well, when you if, if you've ever been to a lecture and you couldn't hear the lecture, but as soon as you turned your attention and now you could get line of sight with the lecture, you could hear them. That's because if you don't see them, about thirty percent of your brain shuts off. Hmm. but as soon as you see them it's part of our primitive reflexes so also when you engage light in the brain with the eyes you actually the whole brain has to activate to process that information even if it doesn't have any information to carry on that frequency but what we're going to carry is all the new stuff that they want to do so then the lights through the ears all the hemoglobin think of your body like a solar panel you're walking around all day long you're absorbing light light frequencies. If we don't get that, there's a disorder called seasonal affective disorder, right? SAD. Yeah. Now the, the, the deal is though, every cell of your body has something called chromoforms in it, which is like little mini batteries. And it stores the energy from the sun or from light sources or from sound. Um, all that energy is built up. If we have enough, then we produce ATP. And we have all this energy that we need to do. Mm -hmm. Well, if we don't have the, if we don't have ATP, we're not going to process even the most powerful nutrients because we can't break them down and use them as energy. So what we want to do is the brain, which is, you know, the central processor of the body, if it doesn't have energy, it can't do its job. So we want to deliver energy there. So the, the hemoglobin absorbs the light, circulates it through the body. And then what's something that's really big right now, the mitochondrial health factor, you know, that everybody's talking about, right. what the mitochondria wants more than anything else is light because it's energy it wants that energy so we're gonna that 
if the mitochondria is dying or what they call apoptosis, then it actually attracts that the hemoglobin that has the energy, it will exchange that energy and that cell will actually start back up again with the new with a new action set. And so it basically returns to, to health. Yeah. And if we if we do that right, then we've also built a pathway into the body of uh, through vasodilation, blood flow and circulation. And at that moment, it happens, the body actually produces nitric oxide. And not to be confused with what you get at the dentist, but what this does, <laughs> it creates vasodilation. So in our brains, when people have headaches, for instance, it's, it's really very similar to if you took your finger and you wrapped a rubber band around it and the mm -hmm. tip of your finger starts hurting. As soon as you take the rubber band off, the pain goes away. Right. That's what's happening in the brain. It's not getting enough oxygen. So it's basically signaling to you, hey, you're killing off some brain cells here. We need to get some oxygen in there. Maybe you're dehydrated. Maybe you didn't eat the right foods. Mm -hmm. Maybe you're just stressed out. And those, that stress restricts those uh, capillaries all over the whole body. So, you know, what we want to do is open those up, get more blood flow circulation. And so that's the, the light is also at a beat frequency. So just like you're hearing it, our, our skin is the most, um, if you will, it, think of your ears. They were once skin, it folded and made an ear, it folded and made an eye, it folded and made your nose, it folded and made your, your lips. These proteins all folded and did that, but they started out as skin matter. So your skin is a receiver. We've all had experiences where we're watching TV and somebody walks up behind us and we feel them, right. you know, before it's not just a Jedi mind trick, <laughs> you know, our, our brain can do that. Right. Yeah. And so we're receiving all this information. Some people are more sensitive than others, but depending upon who you are, we need to tune in to get the brain instead of dysregulating. What was happening with these women was their brain was dis dysregulated their left hemisphere was actually moving slower than their right hemisphere. Mm -hmm. So that meant information delivered to the cerebral cortex was coming in at different speeds and they became anxious, irritable. Um, they would get depression. This was all a symptom of brain speed. Once we trained their brain, we were able to, the biggest thing I think that the preliminary test showed us is that you can reorganize after a, a traumatic event. We all know older people that get traumatized in the morning or stressful event, whatever happens, they're still talking about it that night, the next week, you know, you can't seem to shake it. Yeah. And really it's about disengaging this nervous system and allowing the innate intelligence of our body to take over and, and do what it does best, which is to keep us healthy. So you, so you were able to get them to have their left and right hemisphere basically be working together again. I mean, how, how does we, that we had, we had them sync, they synchronized in six weeks. Wow. And then as long as they do a brain tap session uh, three times a week, every 72 hours, it will maintain that because our nervous system tries to reset every 72 hours. That's why like weightlifters just found that out um, without knowing it. You know, you lift weights every other day yeah. because our body gets stressed out. It needs time to recover. Stress it out. It needs time to recover. Our brain we can do up to three sessions of brain tap a day. And that's exactly what we did with these people mm -hmm. because we have sessions in the morning. If you look on the app, when you're looking at there's ones for wake up. Yeah. Well, if you have to use a chemical to wake up, which means coffee or tea or stimulant, then your body's not regulating correctly. And your body's always looking for ways to circumvent having to do anything. The, you know, if you do it for it, if you like, for instance, if you drink coffee every morning, first thing in the morning, then your body's going to say, okay, we don't have to, we don't have to excite these brain waves. Right. But there's a brain wave called SMR, sensory motor rhythm. And as we get, you know, better looking and more intelligent with age, certain things happen to our brain, right? Yeah. And people think balance has to do with exercise. We proved that wrong. Hmm. Balance has to do with brain waves. If you don't have SMR brain waves, you will not have balance. Somebody who has super balance, I'm going to show you somebody who has super SMR brain waves. Like when we work with our Olympians or pro athletes, they are just maxed out and they can go there and get into that flow state and they have it. And people that are losing their balance and, and can't, you know, basically move and think, you know, that's what separates us from most other animals. We can move and think instead of just reacting, but that takes a lot of brain power. You know, like basketball, for instance, is high level physics. You know, they're just doing it naturally. Right. Yeah. So, I mean, there, there's a skill component to that, right? So naturally their brain has to work and help the proprioception. So like chicken or the egg type thing, like if you're doing that, your brain is naturally going to be more active, correct? Yes. That's why like when they're, when our doctors are working with like autistic children, they'll do something like the metronome 
where they have to do things with both arms. And we like doing like martial arts because it shows that's one way to get the brain engaged. Exercise is still the number one best way to train the brain. It's just people don't realize that. They think they're exercising to build muscle, but you're really keeping your brain fit. Yeah, I mean, that's that's why I went when I, as you probably know, I'm a fitness professional. So I'll have people do some sort of skill work in every single session or something that they're not used to. So they're forced to like think yeah, I mean, pun intended, like think about what they're doing to make it a much harder event. So it's actually helping their cognition their proprioception and everything else. But then people like do these same things over and over again. I imagine that that SMR probably isn't as elevated, right? Right. Well, once they do it, the it'll, it'll maintain it. Once yeah. you, once you teach them how to do it, that's why it's so difficult. Like we have one doctor that started doing something where they, they walk and this seems easy to most of us in, in recite the alphabet. You would be surprised how people can't walk and recite the alphabet. It's just, we did this in front of a group of our doctors, in front of 300 doctors, and no one did it right the first time. <laughs> it seems easy, but, you know, when you step out, it's A, B, C, and then you have to do it backwards. So after you do it forwards, but you learn to do, when once he taught them to do it, they were actually faster doing it backwards than they were doing it forward because they had preconceived ideas about how to say the alphabet. So he was he was kind of proving out how the brain likes novel experiences to build the neuroplasticity. And then it stayed, you know, when throughout the weekend, of course, we had an event. So every once in a while, they would just, he said, just when you see somebody in the hall, just kind of quiz them a little bit. And people were finding, hey, my brain can learn something new very quickly, as long as it's fun, you know, and movement for a lot of people, especially we deal with a lot of chiropractors. So they're very kinesthetic. If they're not touching or feeling or moving, they're not learning. Yeah, you, know, you don't learn well just sitting behind a desk and listening to somebody talk at the chalkboard. So, so could we learn better if we were? I mean, obviously, you don't want to walk and read a book and we're walking mm-hmm. in traffic. But how could we learn better while incorporating movement? Maybe like turn on a podcast, something like that. Are we going to learn better that way? Oh yeah. Well, you're going to retain it better. Yeah. Because we all have slippage, they call it. You know, where you you we can only handle so much information at one time. Then the brain's got to s- synchronize it and do their thing. That's why um, TV shows now, 20 minutes of commercials, it's terrible. You know, if if you don't have TiVo or something. Yeah. You know, so in the in the that's because they know that people can only watch for so long. Then they get they start dream, daydreaming doing something else. But right. if you're already doing something else. The information can go in to the first attention. That's why some people do better with audio than others, of course. Yeah. Um, I love audio because I'm more of that way. I listen to books on tape and podcasts all the right. time. Uh, that's how I spend my time that when I'm out doing something. But some people need to see it and read it, you know. So just to, you got to have that balance. The the real key is to learn it multiple ways. You know, mm-hmm. if you can do it visually, auditorily, kinesthetically, you know, if you can work it in into all of that. And the other thing is once you're done learning. If you can do a little meditation on what you just learned, your the hippocampus whole job really, or one of the main jobs of it is to take short-term memories and make long-term memories. And if you do that correctly, then you have a feedback loop, which means when you need that information, you get the information. Yeah. If not, you get slippage because you've never, you never trained your brain to store that information. So is that like the memory consolidation where we, we talk about, you know, the studying right before you go to sleep and then that actually helps consolidate the, 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 the what you learned? Exactly. Yes. And we've all fallen asleep on the couch watching like a World War II movie. We'll wake up in a dream. We're in World War II. Right. So this brain, this 100 billion neurobit processor can go to work solving problems for you while you sleep. And it's really taking whatever was that last hour. That's why that sleep hygiene is so important. What are you doing in that last hour? What are you what are you feeding your brain that's going to give you the feedback loop through your dreams that's going to basically help you to take whatever you learn today? The brain is always saying, what did you learn today? What do I need for the future to stay safe mm. and achieve things? But mostly it's to protect you. It's not really looking to improve your life in a million different ways. It's looking to keep you alive because that's just the nature of our brain. That's why negative news is so popular right. instead of positive news. <laughs> you know? Right. Yeah. I mean, yeah, I, I honestly, I, I would watch a show about puppies and kittens and stuff all day long and, and good things. And maybe there's something with that. So yeah. why is, um, you know, having a sleep routine and getting that sleep so important? Well, the biggest key reason is that our brain in 2016, American scientific actually 
came out, they came clean, the medical community did, and said that we have lymphatic vessels in the brain. Now they call them glial lymphomic vessels, uh, just to, to say it's different than our lymphatic system. And most exercise physiologists know that everywhere there's a blood vessel, there's a lymphatic vessel. But before 2016, they said that wasn't true for the brain. Mm. So it is true. There is one. But the only time it opens up is if you're in level four or paralytic sleep. So if you don't reach that deep level four sleep, in almost every device now, we do a lot of work with a company called Biostrap, mm -hmm. and they, they help us out with our research because it's pretty easy to use. And then, or use the Aura Ring or something like that that measures sleep, whatever you have, or Apple Watch, all these. If you look at, if you get an hour of deep sleep and two hours of REM sleep, you're going to wake up like Superman. You're going to beat any, you're going to score in the 90s to 100% on any of these because they're not, they're just measuring these, these parameters. Yeah. And what happens is if you, if you don't reach that, then the brain doesn't detox. That's the main thing. So they call it the drainage system of the, of the brain. But just like we can't take in, uh, we have that blood brain barrier to get into the brain. Mm -hmm. We have this is stopping things from coming out of the brain. So it, it's really important during sleep that we sleep. Now you're not going to get an hour at one time. So the people listening go, how do I No, you get a millisecond here, two minutes here, uh, three minutes here, and it's cyclic. So you're going through these cycles. And most people have woke up at some point in their life where they couldn't move during sleep. They, they real, and this is the Realism. paralytic sleep. Yeah. Basically, you woke up in the middle of a cleaning cycle. You know, the, 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 you were taken offline, in other words, yeah. so that your body could deal with the brain at that point and get the toxins out. If you don't, then you get the, there's a big movement out there. It's been for a number of years now called uh, leaky gut. Mm -hmm. Right. People talk about that. We now know that if you have legions in the gut, you also have them in the brain. Mm. You have a leaky brain. So that's why it's so important. And they match, they mirror, right? The, the gut actually, the gut brain connection is, is really, really important. I mean, if you don't, if you don't detox the brain, if you don't sleep well, you'll get that irritable bowel syndrome. That's the biggest reason people miss work in the world is they call it an upset stomach, but it's right. really an ear to balls uh, situation. No shit. I uh, had, had to say that. Mm -hmm, that's uh, right. <laughs> so it said, I mean, is, is it more important then to take care of the brain so the brain can take care of the gut? Because you got all these people taking, you know, these probiotics and prebiotics, which obviously ha have a place. And I'm sure that you recommend certain supplements, which I would love to get into. But I mean, is it more important to take care of the brain so it's detoxifying at night, which will help help the gut? Or are they, are well, they the biggest reason you need it? Most people know, or they, at least they grew up saying prayers before they ate or something like that. Yeah. Um, that's good to do whatever spirituality you are. But the reality is you're calming down your nervous system so you can actually digest and metabolize the food. Mm. So ancient science knew, hey, we need to calm down or we don't digest our food right. We get, we have to take little purple pills and we, you know, we have to do all these things. And really the body just needs to relax to do that. So yeah. the most important thing, you can take the world's greatest supplements and I can guarantee you, you'll just flush them out of the system because as long as you're in chronic low level stress, your body thinks it's being chased by a saber toothed tiger. Yeah. So that means you're gonna to have to keep upping the dosage, hoping that the body will assimilate and digest it. We did a study in, uh, Provo, Utah, with a group that does IV uh, supplement, uh, you know, IV supplement yeah. for the brain. They do work with uh, helping people with addiction therapy. And when they had them doing brain tap at the same time they were doing their IV therapy, they absorbed up to 30% more of the nutrients. So if you want to, if you want your supplementation to work better, de-stress. Yeah, you know, I mean, I, I've heard this heard this before that uh, you know the gratitude, and obviously, you know, I, I tell people all the time that if you're going, we're, go, we're going from a stressful situation of a workout, which is a good thing, right? That's just acute stress and not chronic stress and inflammation and cortisol, which people like they get freaked out. Oh, my cortisol's up. Well, working out causes that to go up. So, mm -hmm. but you need to eat at least take like a few minutes of do do some deep breathing or or, or uh, physiological size, whatever it is, right? And you can absorb those nutrients much much better as opposed to chugging a protein shake like once you put that weight down I mean, what's the best way for people to kind of de-stress whether it's you know uh, right, right before a meal or you know before bedtime well i think before a meal is just calming down stop the whatever you're doing that might be a stressful activity and breathe a little bit if you do pray then do that yeah. uh, before a meal um 
one of my favorite pictures I share is we're, we actually put in a 20 station brain tap room for sporting Kansas city, which is the professional soccer team. Uh -huh. What they do is after any of their workouts, they go in and they use those decompression boots at the same time they're doing the decompression boots. They're doing a brain tap session. And we have a picture of like 20 of them doing it at one time. Okay. And that's what I show to people because they know that they recover faster. The whole thing is if you can start the recovery, Sure. then the body starts to mend and, and gets better. Uh, plus when you're, when you do this, that mind muscle connection, I actually did a program and it was, I had a four page feature in Ironman magazine because I was showing them how we proved that the acetylcholine actually binds at the mind muscle connection. If you want to build more muscle without um, taking steroids, then do a session before your workout, do a session after your workout. We proved that you'll actually gain more muscle because there's your, basically have the acetylcholine you need at the mind muscle junction while you're working out. And that's why visualizing while you're working out is so important. Yeah. So while you're visualizing the muscles growing, you're actually recruiting more of the uh, HGH and all of that that the body will produce because the, the brain is following your thoughts. If you're, if you're doing the work and going, no, I'm so much pain. Oh, this is so bad. Well, I mean, we all know people that go to the gym all the time. I'm always looking at them going, you've been here for three months. I haven't seen you. You, you gained weight, you <laughs> right, know, right. because they're too stressed out or they're, they don't understand like high impact training and things like that. Yeah. Um, and so we, we try to, we try to talk to them about that. I think, I think that at night before going to bed, we always recommend go around your home, turning off lights. If you think about it, if we were a hundred years ago or 200 years ago, and we were out hunting and gathering. We lived on the plains here or something, and it was getting dark. We're going to go back to our tribe, and we're going to have a fire, right. and we're going to sit down. We're going to talk about our day. We're going to relax, and it's not just going to be the women doing that. Everybody's going to be doing that, and then when those logs go out, we don't go to the woods and get more logs. We go, hey, it's time for bed. You know, we're, we're going to go to sleep. What do we do? We turn on another light. We turn, turn the channel to another station. We engage our brain in other activities. So think of uh, what we really recommend if you, is that you wind down with the lights, only watch like comedy, something that's light, light watching at night so you can get into the mood of sleeping. Yeah. You know, some people, 25% of the people need an actual routine or they will not sleep. Right now, as we're filming this, two thirds of the American population has a chronic sleeping problem. Two thirds. Wow. Because they're they're staying up really late watching whatever shows they watch. Which is almost directly not to cut you off, which is almost directly correlated with the overweight and ob obesity rates. Oh yeah, I mean the stress of one event, one stressful event, a Freddy Krueger movie has probably fifty of them in there, right? <laughs> but if you one stressful event, your liver produces enough sugar to be a Milky Way bar. You didn't have to eat a Milky Way bar to produce enough sugar that now your insulin, you know, your insulin has to be released in insulin's a fat storage hormone. So what happens? You build fat, your, your body doesn't know you're sitting on the couch already eating Cheetos and drinking Mountain Dews to stay awake, you know, and then the body's just, you're compounding it. And then we wonder why there's such diabetes on the planet. I, I've worked with people that said, I don't eat sugar at all. I can't believe it. And then I find out they smoke. I go, do you know that the cigarette is eight to 18% sugar? <laughs> and you're, you're mainlining sugar into the system. If you, what do you do if you want to really get high with heroin? You smoke it. If you really want to get high on sugar, which is low grade heroin, you're going to smoke it. You know, so the, the, you know, yeah. the, they, they don't, they think that they think that the people that made the cigarettes addictive, the, the problem we have is they now own craft foods. So I always tell people, don't eat anything made by elves. You know, you know, that it's not just magical. It's got some crazy stuff in it that's going to make you very addictive. There's you know? something in that tree, man. There's. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, occasionally, maybe that's okay, like parties yeah. and picnics and things. But I mean, some people make this their life mission to destroy their health one meal at a time, and they don't even realize it. Yeah, it is interesting how, how we are a product of everything that we do, you know, whether it's sitting for an extended period of time, and you probably know this, there was a study that came out where uh, four hours of sitting, you actually have um, less blood flow to your brain. So literally, they said every two hours, get up and just walk around for two minutes, like something that simplistic, yeah. we still like have a hard time grasping that we want to do. I mean, it, what what is that about human nature? We just like things that just like, seems so easy we, we can't do well i think it's we're, we're creatures of habit that's not yeah. just an expression our our brains our bodies 
in, you know, the, it really even goes down to Hebb's law, which states those neurons that fire together, wire together. You know, in, if they don't fire together, they wire apart. I mean, that's kind of the way all of our behaviors, all learned processes go. So we're, we get used to, uh, in psychology 101, some of your listeners might remember the two frog story, you know, where you have the one frog that they put in the pot, they bring it to a boil slowly, it dies because it doesn't realize every day the incremental changes of the heater just not so bad. So it's doing the backstroke one minute, it's dead the next, right? <laughs> right. The, um, the other one, they bring the pot to a boil and you, they threw the frog into it. Of course, it jumped right out. So if people knew the stress their body was under, they would get out of it. But the problem is they're in it. They, and I love, there's a, there was a video going around about fish and the fish were all asking, where's the water? And the whole thing is, where's the water? Where's the water? You're in it. You're swimming in it. That's the stress. You're mm -hmm. in it. You're swimming in it. You're, you, you know, I, I tell people uh, all the time, it's kind of like that movie, I see dead people and they don't know they're dead, but right. I see stressed out people and they don't even know they're stressed, you know, and yeah. they think it's normal to have anxiety and fear. And uh, those aren't normal things. Those are, those should be occasional things that we are, are that attack us, let's say, but some people don't get out of bed until they have a good list of fears built up <laughs> and anxieties. And now they go, oh, yep, it's time to start my day. Let's go get my coffee to exacerbate the problem. Right. <laughs> you know? So how, how would people, I mean, there's, there's a, there's a lot of individuals that are just chronically stressed and they don't know it is how can we really like tap into that and figure out if we are chronically stressed? Well, one thing is if you go to bed and you start tightening up, like they call it tetna in, in psychology, but mm -hmm. people get into the fetal position, but some people will actually go to bed and they'll start tightening up muscles. If you cramp at night, mm -hmm. you are super stressed. Um, if you wake up in the morning, you've been clenching your jaw or clenching your fist, yeah. you should be, you should wake up like a wet noodle. You know, you should be, you know, you should be relaxed and limber. Uh, and so the first thing we teach people is breathing. Yeah. You know, most people do not breathe right. If you think of every negative emotional state on the planet, there's one thing that they all have in common, lack of air, mm. right? People, in order to be angry, we've all had it happen to us when we were younger, you get angry, they go, breathe, breathe. And that, of course, that makes us even angrier. Right. But the, the reality is if we breathe, we can't be angry anymore because emotions are energy in motion. They're not energy that burn. But if you have these negative emotions, it kind of works like a filament in a light bulb. It burns out the system because there's no flow, there's no flow state. Mm -hmm. Anger, fear, depression, anxiety, every negative emotion has lack of, if you breathe through them, you won't have them anymore. Because yeah. our body's not designed to hold on to those. Our body's designed to get a signal that says, hey, there's, there's a reason to be anxious here. There's a saber tooth tiger over there or whatever, yeah. let's run. And then you, then you take action and run. But the first response, everybody always says fight or flight, but the first response we all have is the freeze response. And so this freeze response actually shows up in psychology as lack of motivation hmm. because it's not just a physical thing we freeze on our brain freezes. Like when somebody says, I just can't make a decision. I need somebody to help me here. And then somebody comes up with a really easy solution. They go, wow, why didn't I think of that? Right. Well, because you were locked in a neurological storm that you couldn't see the forest, you know, despite the trees, yeah. you know, so you, that's why getting outside yourself and doing something like meditation or brain tap or breathing exercise. I love like Wim Hof breathing, mm -hmm. things like that. Not everybody can do that. I don't recommend if you've never done any breathing, right. that you do yeah. that. but there are some other, you should look into doing some pranayamas and things like that. Get into some yoga breaths. You can on YouTube, find those. It's it's pretty easy. Start. That's the first thing I always tell people. You need to learn to breathe. They go, what do you mean? If if you're sitting there talking and every once in a while you go, you know, people do that all the time. They they and they go, they go, oh, it just happened. Well, they were holding their breath that whole time you were talking. Because some people, that's the way they process information. They hold their breath. Right. And you know, it's 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 all about breathing and getting people into the flow, and then the body will take care of itself. Yeah. What's, what's the simplest way if you were to explain it to somebody on just how to breathe properly? I mean, Wim Hof two, and all these other things, you know, obviously yeah, there's you know, two, high level. there's two breathing techniques. We teach people that are very simple, very easy. At, and you do them at night, right before bed. Okay. Uh, and by the way, most people go to sleep all wrong. They go to sleep thinking I'm going to close my eyes. I'm going to pass out. I'm going to be dead to the world. And if that doesn't happen, they get all upset and angry. It should take you between five and 10 minutes to go to sleep. Okay. 
And, and the reason for that is you want to offload all this stress. So there's two breathing techniques we teach people and to change it up, because if you do something too much, it's like lifting weights, you know, you got to change that up because the muscles will get that memory and then they won't, they won't build as quickly. Right. So the first one is you breathe into the count of four. When you breathe in, you are actually triggering the sympathetic system. That's mm -hmm. the fight or flight. So that's four seconds. Okay. Then at the peak of that, you breathe out to the metal count of eight. Okay. So this is in for the nose, out through the mouth. Doesn't matter. Just Doesn't matter. whatever works. Okay. You know, um, some people will say only through the breath. You, you'll see it in many different ways. Find what works for you. The main thing is get the ear air in and then breathe out. When you get to the end, then breathe in again. Okay. Get all that. Most people don't have the lung capacity to breathe and then breathe out slowly to the middle count of eight. If you've ever done like HRV and you do this exercise, you'll blow away an HRV score because this, this is a way you can manipulate the, the, uh, that uh, sinus node that they're measuring <laughs> for the HRV. Okay. So, but anyway, you're doing that. Now you do that while you're doing that, you visualize the different parts of your body in this is called a body scan. Yeah. And when you do that, what happens is where your attention goes, energy follows. So when you think of your feet, the blood flows there because it follows the energy of that. Right. And with blood flow and circulation comes relaxation. If you practice that, what'll happen is eventually you'll get to the top of your head, maybe once, probably not. Most people fall asleep by the time they get to their hips. Yeah. That's fine. You've set in motion a way to unwind all the stress from the day. Now, the other one, you do the same things, but the other breathing process is called box breathing. Mm -hmm. It's very simple. You breathe into the metal count of four. You hold it now for the metal count of four. You breathe out to the metal count of four and you leave it out for the metal count of four. And you continue that process as you scan your body. And these are just a couple of yogic breaths, they call them, but they will, they will definitely now, if you want to get fancy, you can start doing one nostril, the other nostril, you yeah. can hold your breath, you can breathe out through your uh, mouth or, or a lot of uh, the yogic practices say only breathe in the mouth is only for eating food. The nose is for, you know, getting air into the system. Yeah. So, you know, there's, a, and they also know that the more you breathe out of your mouth, you know, there are, when you read books, especially they'll, they'll talk about the thugs as being mouth breathers. Right. Yeah, I think I was at um, I don't know, Game of Thrones. I think it's a mouth breathers too. I think they did, <laughs> yeah. like, at least a couple of movies a year they talk about mm -hmm. mouth breathers. So you, you've got the the four eight. So you've got the the one to two ratio of inhalation to exhalation with a body scan, and you have your box breathing, which is you know four 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 or you know I guess whatever number you, you want can to increase that if you want as you as you get practice with it. Okay, because the so the, the one I did last night is you were talking and there was some music and there was some like tones, I think, underneath mm -hmm. it. And, you know, think about the number 100, you know, mm -hmm. and, and then erase the 100 four times, which makes sense because you're, you're I'm probably doing that breathing technique anyways. And I think by the time you, you kept saying by the time you hit 93, like you won't get to 93. I think it was the number. Mm -hmm. I'm pretty sure I think I hit 97. Mm -hmm. And then I woke up enough to take my headphones out. Like I was probably 10 or 20 minutes later. And then I pretty much, you know, hit the pillow and, and I was out. So what's happening during, so there's the, you know, obviously the breathing component of it. There's also a, a, a meditative component. So what's happening during meditation to the brain? Well, what we're first doing, the first four minutes of all sessions are synchronizing the hemispheres. Mm -hmm. But the reason we're using the numbers there is we want to engage the left brain but then put it to sleep. So we're, again, it's almost like that breathing thing. We're gonna bring up the left hemisphere, which would be engaging that sympathetic system, but then we're erasing it. Yeah. And the brain goes, well, he just wants us to erase it. He doesn't want us to, you understand? So then the brain starts to become adaptive yeah. and it'll start to learn, oh, we just want the left brain to go away. And it's something silly, right? I mean, people aren't gonna really, you know, they're the old saying about counting sheep, you know, and things like that. The whole reason that works is you're, you're basically giving your brain something to do with the energy. That's, that's pinned up there. And when the brain synchronizes and it's natural time for sleep, we're going to take you from a state of beta, which is the wide awake state. We call it the reactionary mind. We're going to get you into the alpha state. Naturally, you'll go into sleep when it's sleep time. Mm. And I always tell people, if you've ever been to like a, the symphony, which my wife used to work at the symphony, so we'd go all the time. I'd look around and half the room's sleeping yeah. for $200. I'm going, gosh, that's the most expensive nap it's they've ever taken. It's a very expensive nap. <laughs> But, they're, but they don't know that that music actually is something called the Mozart effect in science, that that 10 hertz frequency music 
the brain goes there and it says, oh, we're an alpha. We must be, want to go to theta. We, then they go to delta and they go to sleep because they're not trained to stay in that brainwave state. Mm -hmm. It's kind of like uh, I used to run the quarter mile in track uh, in, in college. And I would, my splits, right? Every corner were the same. Like whatever, whatever I ran, it wasn't like, even though it looked like I ran faster out of the blocks than I did coming in. But when you measured it, it was all the same, but you had to stay in a flow state. You couldn't push too much or you'd burn out your energy. You right. couldn't slow down too much or you'd lose that momentum. So they're in, and that's what happens when, and if you look at the Olympic athletes, they're all relaxed. Right. You know, that's one thing our coach would, would film us. This is, we didn't have the nice stuff like we have now, right. but he would film us. And if our jaw wasn't, you know, if we're running like this, you know, people do that all the time, you're going to be a lot slower when you do that. Yeah. So part of it is just getting the body to offload that stress. When the hemispheres are synchronized, the body will naturally do that. You'll naturally go into this altered state that you go to anyway when you're really tired and you're able to sleep. So basically we're mimicking a natural sleep cycle. And if it's your natural sleep cycle, the body, because you don't actually have sleeping problems, uh, maybe yeah. you, you went faster. Some people will make it through there till 93, you know, because they, they're stressed out and they, they don't know how to control their mind until they learn how to do that. Yeah. I was, I was out pretty quick and I, I, I try to, you know, have a, a good, you know, circadian clock where I'm going to bed about the same time every day, getting up at the same time every day and wear blue light blocking glasses. And I get up mm -hmm. and look at the sun, you know, first thing in the morning, oh, great, and I had yeah. Dr. Andrew Huberman on my podcast, mm -hmm. uh, before he blew up, like he's, you know, really famous right now. Um, but so all these things that are trying to just train my body. And, and then I've started doing some, you know, light meditative work or the art of doing nothing, I guess, you know, during the day. So is that similar to what's happening? Like if people are meditating during the day, is there some sort of, um, you know, regenerative component like sleep is happening too? Yeah. You're going to imitate a cycle of sleep. If you can really get it. The, the downside to this though, is we've measured about uh, 30,000 brains over the last 10 years. Yeah. Most people, when they meditate, actually stress their brain out. Mm -hmm. They don't, they're not getting the result they want because they're, they're thinking too much and they're doing, th you know, it's not about not thinking, but it's about how do we direct our awareness? So what we did is we did several different studies. And if you do a session in the middle of the day, for instance, a 20 minute session, we found that you can reclaim about 80% of the energy you had in the morning, mm -hmm. because that energy comes from basically liberating the energy that's in your body instead of using it for uh, walking around thinking and all that you're just taking the time to quiet down now you can focus all that energy and the body gets these stores of energy back that are, that are necessary interesting so um, i saw on that in your app you also can you know help people quit smoking and all sorts of different things i mean how is that possible you know from what you guys have found well, what, I, what we know is that you get what you rehearse in life, not what you intend, mm. right? A lot of people intend on doing things, but I want you to imagine your favorite movies, but they never rehearsed. They just went and shot the movie. You yeah. know, that's what people are doing with their life right now. They're not, they're not preparing. They're not planning. They're not strategizing. They're not brainstorming. They basically get up every morning and go, hmm, yeah, I guess today I'm going to stop smoking. And then they, the first urge, they go, well, I guess that didn't work, you know? <laughs> And the, the reality is that we always make the number one best choice. But if there's not a better choice available, we'll always default to what we've always done because our subconscious, which runs 95% of the programs, you know, uh, Bruce Lipton who wrote Biology of Belief, if, if people want to really know the inner workings of like quantum thought, he talks about it there that you're thinking, uh, people think that they can change with their conscious mind. Everybody knows the 21 days, you've probably heard that before, it takes 21 days to make a change. That's never been proven hmm. ever. In fact, the study showed that Stanford did and also Harvard verified or the other way around one of the two. Yeah. And what they showed was, yeah, you can get a change in 21 days, but guess what? You've got to do visualization and relaxation techniques with it. You're not just doing it in 20. They actually proved it takes 18 months to make a physical change if you're doing it with your conscious mind making those changes. But that doesn't sound as sexy as 21 days. You know, everybody can do that. So the whole thing is, it's it's really a one day at a time approach, you know, but one, I love the expression that says, live each day like it's your last, but, uh, you know, think that way, but then live as if you're going to live forever. You know, it's mm -hmm. like, you don't just go out and what is the food you're eating today going to build? Because the body you have today, the way we focus on it is the body you have today was made two years ago. 
not yesterday. Mm -hmm. So it didn't matter if you ate a chocolate cookie yesterday. What mattered was the box of chocolate cookies you ate two years ago, you right. know, th things like that. So it's, it's a little bit, we, we are so, especially in America, we're so fixated on instantaneous gratification that we're not willing to put in the effort and the time. And, you know, the, somebody might look at you and go, oh, I want to be just like you. And you go, well, here's what I do. Oh, I can't do that. But I want to look just like you. <laughs> you know? I, I have a, one of my, one of my slides I show in one of the presentations has, I don't know if you used to drink a quick, uh, the Nestle's quick, yeah. you know, the chocolate milk. Oh man. I used to love that stuff. Yeah. yeah. So, so we made one of those and I had an artist make a little guru guy meditating a little rabbit and it says cosmic cosmic quick consciousness two scoops to instant buddha because that's what people want they don't want to they don't want to go to the mountains for 30 years they don't want to give up all these things they they want to do everything they're currently doing but then get all the benefits of somebody who sacrificed and took care of themselves you know the the old the old saying if i knew i was going to live this long i'd have taken better care of myself you know is no more true now today we're finding that out people that didn't take care of themselves they're not making it yeah, yeah, that makes that makes a lot of sense. So, I, I mean, it, it, this month is actually, um, you know, World Men Mental Health Awareness mm -hmm. Month. What is your advice for people who suffer with, you know, mental illness? I suffer with from depression and anxiety. What can people do? And obviously, this we we don't want the quick fix because there is no quick fix in life, as as you just mentioned. But what can people do to start alleviating anxiety and depression and all all of these like negative factors that are surrounding us? The the two things that we find are the the best. They might not be the quickest, but one is, of course, is exercise. Mm -hmm. When you exercise, you're actually triggering your pharmacy. The the biggest pharmacy on earth is not on the corner. It's between your ears. You know, we can release 30,000 different neurochemicals with our own thinking and acting. Mm -hmm. So get out there, get moving. The worst thing you can do when you're mentally uh, struggling is to set um, because you're just going to sit in your juices, right? You're stewing. Um, then, but if you are going to sit, you should be doing some form of meditation, some, some form of positive visualization, what might be termed now positive psychology. Yeah. And that means like being grateful. If you don't have anything to be grateful for, then you really need to do a grateful meditation because you should be grateful. You, you've got to get the habit of just being grateful, having peace with your environment, changing the things you can, visualizing your future. You know, the um, not that everything's going to happen, but uh, when I took training a number of years ago in the 80s, actually, from Deepak Chopra, I remember one of the things he said that blew me away, and I've been using it ever since. He says that 90% of what's going to happen to you tomorrow, you know about today. So what are you pretending not to know? So if you know you're depressed today and you're just going to be depressed tomorrow, change something, right. you know, don't keep doing the same thing, thinking you're going to get a different result. Right. So change it up, get rid of sugar completely. And I recommend a good friend of mine, Daryl Joffrey, who wrote the book, get off your sugar. Mm -hmm. It's a wonderful book. Scott also talks about brain tap throughout the whole thing, but yeah. because he, he, he talks about his journey of sugar addiction and it's a very good book. And, um, sugar is just you know as a chemical it, it's it's worse than heroin right for people to get off because it's everywhere and i think doing some form of meditation right before going to bed you know train yourself to feel good it, happiness is a choice mm -hmm. it's not it's not up to someone else or something else to make you happy it's yeah. an inside job and you have to fake it till you make it yeah. You know, the, you know, and we all know people that went out and did exercise, you know, they were depressed or whatever. They started exercising. You see them six months later and they're all smiles and happy. So they did it through physiology. Yeah. Right. And other people do it through psychology. Right. They do it through their their mind and what they do. But I think if you can do them at the same time, now you've got a powerful force working with you to create this change. And, it, and I always tell people it's kind of the exact opposite of Zen Buddhism. Zen Buddhism says cease expecting and you have all things. So that means, eh, just, you know, that's not the American way we want. We expect everything, you know, but what I say is expect everything, but be grateful of anything. Mm. You, know, you know, you've got to be grateful. Yeah. And so if today you wake up and, you know, you start to feel a little bit better for an hour, hold on to that, mm. really focus on it. That will expand because the brain only does what you put energy on. It doesn't, it's not making you depressed. It's doing that because it thinks that's what you want. And as hard as it is for people like that to understand is you've created a habit, a pattern, an addiction, really, to feeling bad. 
there's, I mean, we, there's never been a better time to live in the, in the history of the world, even though there's craziness going on around us. I mean, you, you have a chance because of what we carry, you know, these, these things we carry around, we can select the soundtrack to our life. Mm. Now think of the middle ages. You had to be royalty to have the symphony come and play in the hall. <laughs> we can do that right here. We can have the Philharmonic playing on our phone, or we can listen to the world's greatest rock bands, whatever we want. So, but people still choose to let other people dictate how they feel. And this is the biggest, this is the biggest problem we have is that people looking outside themselves to find their happiness. Yeah. I mean, I, I think that that's great advice and social media and all this sort of stuff can, it really goes into all of that. And I did a TED talk years ago, years ago, and I said, social media is, is the death of expertise, you know, like, they get, like anybody can be famous on social media. Now it's amazing. I found you on social media. So it's like that love hate relationship. Right. But for me, Back in March of 2020, we all know what happened. I, mm -hmm. Gym shut down, everything shut down. I, I started looking, I'm like, man, the gyms are shut down. I can't travel anymore. I can't host these things. I can't do all this TV stuff. I started looking at all these negative things. And then after a month or two, I started realizing, you know what? I get to be home with my son who was two at the time. And he gets to run down the hall and say, Baba's home, which is dad in Greek and, <laughs> and like hug me. And I get to experience all of these amazing things with him growing up that I wouldn't have got to experience when I'd be at the gym from 5 a.m. until 7 p.m. and just see him at night or for an hour or two and then maybe on the weekends. So I started looking at things that way. I'm like, wow, what is the little silver lining in this? What is what, what can I be grateful for? So then that really helped with you know my depression. And then now what I started doing, I think people listening is I'll do those workouts and then I'll go into, you know, some sort of, you know, parasympathetic breathing and focus on gratitude, even if that's a couple minutes, what I'm grateful for. And that has changed my life. And, and, and you're very, it, you're very spot on with like, we, we have all these things now that we can be grateful for. And I, I appreciate you um, saying that. About, I think that's going to come across to a lot of people. One thing to, to avoid the depression that happens with social media, <laughs> because I, I love the card. I got it for one of my friends once. He said, I hope your life is, is as happy as your Facebook post, <laughs> you know, the, uh, you know, but there's a saying you're, that all unhappiness stems from unfavorable comparisons. Mm. So, you know, if you can stop comparing yourself, there is no one like you in the known universe. Mm. There will never be another person like you. So as soon as you step up and start really acknowledging your own brilliance, and, and I think everyone has something to add value to this world about. It's just, they're unhappy when they're not doing it. So figure yeah. out how you can be of service and, and seek outside yourself instead of trying to make sure everybody's making you happy. Yeah. You know, that's a, that's a big deal. Dr. Porter, I mean, I, I think that's a perfect place to stop. I mean, acknowledge your own brilliance. Mm -hmm. That's great. I, I'm, I'm going to use that. I appreciate you for coming on. Where can people find out more about you and uh, your company? Well, they can go to on social media uh, at BrainTap Tech or at Dr. Patrick Porter. They can they can go to my website, uh, drpatrickporter.com. Uh, they can see the links there. They can also go to braintap.pro. And for 99 cents, they can get a copy of uh, my newest book, Thrive and Overdrive, and they get free time on the app there. So they could go there and check it out. Uh, 99 cents. I, I think people can have 99 cents. We, we can find that in the cushions of our couch, man. Uh, well, I, I thank you so much for being on. I'm Joey Thurman. Here's another episode of the Fatter Future Podcast. Remember, don't be a fatty, F-A-D-D-Y. Be a part of the future. Cheers. That was a great conversation. Thank you so much, Dr. Porter, for coming on the show. Please remember to subscribe and share this podcast because Without the subscribing, the sharing, people downloading this, checking it out on YouTube, I couldn't make it possible. So please subscribe and share. And next week, what is it to be IG famous? I have Dana on the show who has an account that talks about cosmetic procedures that celebrities do. Photoshop, all these things that go into our own anxieties of how we think we're supposed to be because everybody has the highlight reel in life. You really don't want to miss this one. Next week on the Fat or Future Podcast, remember, don't be a fatty, F-A-D-D-Y, and make sure to check me out on Instagram and social media everywhere. Troll nicely at Joey Thurman Fit and Instagram page at Fat or Future Podcast. Be well, and I will see you next week.